11 years and four months, I believe, uh, by the time I left uh, Florida and went back home to Michigan, back to my uh, home church, uh, if you will, 12 Ryan Baptist Church, where I am now pastor. And uh, it's a great blessing to be here, great opportunity to be here to celebrate the 25th anniversary of uh, uh, Grace Baptist Church. And it took me forever up there. I called them to, uh, Grace, and down here before I left, I was calling you folks 12 Ryan. And, and uh, so if I do that, you, you'll just understand who I'm referring to. But um, a lot of great memories, a lot of good times, and we'll talk a little bit more about that Saturday. Uh, we'll spend a couple minutes talking about some of the memories uh, from the church uh, from years gone by. Well, we're here tonight to uh, be thankful to the Lord for uh, bringing this church together. This is His church. Uh, he is the head of this church, and He has allowed it and enabled it to be in existence for 25 years. And I believe that if the church will continue to uphold the truth, uh, continue in the faith, uh, to be a pillar in the ground of the truth, I believe that he'll bless it until he comes. No, it may not be 25 more years. It may uh, be ready for that if that's what we're called upon doing, but we just need to keep on keeping on, don't we? Uh, being faithful to the Lord and uh, to uphold uh, his word and to share his word with a dark and lost and dying world that he might save his people and bring them into his house and uh, they receive scriptural baptism and training uh, in the ways of righteousness. And if we do that, uh, we will be blessed and we will be at peace with God, have the peace of God, and with the joy that's unspeakable and full of glory. And that's what we would desire to do. So we want to encourage you tonight to continue in those things uh, that you received. Uh, guard them, protect them, hold to them. Uh, be on guard and watch for those that would try to uh, deceive or, or trick you or to uh, through su su uh, subtle persuasion to get you to compromise your beliefs and uh, don't go along to get along, don't compromise. Uh, believe the truth, stand for the truth, practice the truth, and God will bless you for it. Amen. Amen. We've heard some great messages already. I mean, there's just been some fantastic messages. The pastor here, Brother Warren, preached just a wonderful message Wednesday night that really set the... Uh, the, uh, the tone for this special services, I believe, and uh, other pastors, uh, preachers have built upon that. We hope the Lord will continue to do that uh, tonight, uh, that it will continue to be built upon uh, as he would desire. We want to thank 12, uh, I was almost did it, Grace Baptist Church. We want to thank you so very much for your kindness and flying us down here. We had a great trip down here. And a great flight, and I think the plane was relatively new. I mean, you guys know how to treat a person. You get a new plane for them, and, uh, and so we appreciate that. And Brother and Sister Bourne, they have just treated us just about every way good possible. Uh, and I tell you, we've just enjoyed it. We've, we've ate, and we've ate, and we've talked, and we ate, and we talked, and we ate, and, and we talked some more. And we slept a little bit in, in between that time. But we thank the Lord so much. For this great honor, this great privilege, great memories flooding my heart and my mind uh, at this very moment. And we're so, so very happy to be here. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, uh, to the book of 1 Thessalonians, chapter 1. Before we get into the reading of God's precious and holy word, we want to just kind of lay a little bit of a foundation for you to build the message on tonight uh, that will uh, encourage you and provoke you to thought um, uh, in, the, in the way that we believe the Holy Spirit would have us to point you. And we, uh, we'll give you a title and uh, then we'll explain that a little bit. And the title is uh, Living in a Glass House. And you've heard that phrase uh, before. Uh, first thought may come to your mind, living in a glass house, you don't want to be throwing stones. And that's a, that's a good thing. You, do, you don't want to be throwing stones. And you could preach a message on that, going in that direction, if that's what God laid upon the heart. But we're going to look at it more as living in a glass house, and you can't hide from people. When you live in a glass house, they see everything you do. Yes. They're watching you. And um, my thought that led me to this is living here in Melbourne, over here at the Parsonage, right behind me here. Is that correct? Right behind me. And uh, over here, on this side of me, is the towers, Trinity Towers. It's a senior citizen home where a complex where people who are getting up in years a little bit, like my father-in-law and mother-in-law, uh, they, li they live over there. And at one time, we had quite a few other members that lived over there. And uh, they don't have a lot to do as you get up in your senior years. Uh, you begin to just kind of laze around and 
Uh, if you're like my father-in-law, you, you get up in the morning and you go sit in your lazy boy and you get up and you eat breakfast and you go take a nap and you get up and you go sit in your lazy boy and you're right, brother. I mean, you, you just kind of have a, a nice, relaxing life. And uh, what you'll find out from living here is that since they're so bored, they watch you all the time. Brother Graber has a wonderful story and, <laughs> and it didn't come into his message, so I'll share it with you a little bit. It won't be in all the details like he would tell it, but... When he was here as pastor, he normally got up and about outside moving around and doing things uh, early in the morning. And uh, he had some visitors come his way and stay with him. And so they talked all night, kind of like we're doing. And uh, got up late, probably around 10, something like that. There's a knock on the door and there's a policeman standing at the door. And he asked him, he says, um, everything all right here? And Brother Graber is, you know, I guess. <laughs> you know, that's fine, you know. Uh, what do you mean? Is everything all right? He said, are you sure everything's okay in there? And he said, yeah, everything's fine. He said, why? He said, well, if somebody over there in, in those buildings called us and said that you're always outside early in the morning and you haven't stirred yet, and they were concerned that something was wrong. <laughs> and and, and people, they watched it. And while I was here, people would come up to me and they'd say, oh, I saw you had pizza the other night, <laughs> and you guys went out to dinner a little later than you normally do. And, uh, you know, they, they watch your life. But not only do they watch your life, yeah. everybody yeah. watches your life. It's true. You're an example. Yeah. And what I want you to understand tonight, everyone in this room, from the youngest child up to the oldest adult, is an example. Right. And you're either a good example, or you're a bad example. Yeah. It's one or the other. No mediocre. And what kind of example are you of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Because that's what I want to challenge you with tonight. I want to encourage you to think about that because if this church is going to continue for the years ahead that the Lord will allow it, and if it's going to grow and if it's going to have a successful ministry, the members of this church need to exemplify the character of Christ. The Bible tells us that uh, in the book of Acts that they took notice in chapter 4 and verse 13 that they had been with Jesus. What made them take notice of that? It was the way they were acting. It wasn't what they were saying. Over in chapter 11, verse 26, I just said, and they were called Christians first at Antioch. That was a, a derogatory term given uh, by their enemies that were as a mockery, saying, they're just like that Christ fellow. Right. The word Christian means to belong to Christ or to be like Christ. They were being watched, and people were observing their attitudes and their character and their behavior and their deportment, all these things. And so we need to be aware that we are an example. And an example, is a, in the Greek, is a pattern. It's a mold. It's a, it's a model. You're a model of Christ. You're a, you're a pattern of Christ in your life. And we're going to cover some things that we'll see in just a minute. But let's, let's get into the Word of God and try to bring out some of these wonderful things. Uh, the Lord tells us that we ought to go out into the world and preach the gospel. We ought to witness. We ought to uh, uh, go out and bring the gospel before the lost and dying world and witness to them. But he also tells us that we're going to find out we're not only to, to talk uh, about the Lord Jesus Christ, we're to live like the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not only to witness, we're to be a witness. We're to be a, and, and, and we'll see toward the end of the message that your, your walk is more powerful than your talk. Amen, it has a greater influence on those around you than what you say. Many say, but not do. But it's doers of the words and not hear his own, is it? Right. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, uh, let's just begin reading. Uh, uh, in verse 2 he says, We give thanks to God always for you, making mention of you in our prayers. Here he's talking to the uh, church, in the, Thessalon the Thessalonian church. Uh, Paul says to him and uh, Silvanus and Timotheus, and Silas and uh, Timothy, uh, they are greeting this church. And he says, we give thanks uh, uh, always for you all, making mention of you in prayer, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. Now, what we want to understand here, first of all, is that there's something special about people telling you that they're remembering you and praying for you, isn't there? When you're going through a challenge, whatever it might be, and someone comes up and just says to you, I want you to know, I remember you and pray for you. That's encouraging, Amen. isn't it? And, and we're to be encouraging, and Paul's being encouraging to this young church. 
This young church is facing a lot of challenges. If you go over to Acts chapter 17, you can find the organization of this church, and you can find that right off the bat, they're, they're facing obstacles, and they're facing challenges. And a group of uh, 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 wicked men and possibly women come, to get, come together, the Jews, and, and they chase Paul and Silas out of there, and Paul and Silas go on down to Berea, and there the Bereans were more noble than the Thessalonians, and that they received the word of God readily, but then they went home and searched the scriptures to see if those things were so. The word noble means they were more fair-minded. They give them a hearing. And that's what any preacher asks of you. Just give it a hearing. Amen. Give a hearing to the word of God. Don't turn the preacher off just because he mentions a word you don't agree with or, or you don't like or something that steps on your toes. Give the word a fair hearing before you shut your ears because it may be to your detriment, maybe to your harm. And that church had a difficult time. Those Thessalonians, they, they, they heard about Paul and Silas down in Berea and they went down there and caused trouble. You're going to face trouble. The Bible says in this world you're going to have tribulation. He says, no fear, I've overcome this world. He says, you're going to have persecution if you live godly. Those that live godly shall suffer persecution. The Bible tells us that if we're going to enter into the kingdom of heaven, we're going to enter that through tribulation, through problems, through trials of our life. Jesus said, the world hated me, don't, and it's going to hate you. Don't be surprised at that. So it's going to be a challenge, and we're going to have a challenge. And tomorrow, the Lord willing, we're going to hopefully tell you how that we can do what we're going to try to encourage you to do tonight in being an example. He goes on down verse 4 and says, Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. Uh, that's always encouraging to someone to know someone loves the Lord, and the Lord saved them. For our gospel came not unto you in word only. Now notice this phrase. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power, and it has to come in power and of the Holy Spirit. If he doesn't enable you, you're not going to understand it. And you're not going to receive it. You're not going to believe it. The word has to do more than just come to you. There has to be some other things happening. And that's, that happens from God. He sends the Holy Spirit to give you a new heart and ears to hear. And he puts within you uh, faith and repentance to exercise toward the Lord Jesus Christ to the saving of your soul. But he says here, For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit, and in much assurance as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. Notice he says, it also came with much assurance because you know what kind of men we were. How did they know that? They watched their lives. They saw their faith. They saw what they were doing. It wasn't just the word, it was their life. It was their behavior. It was the conduct of those men that were preaching the word. Right. So you may go out and witness. You may pass out tracts. You may hang flyers on a door. You may talk to someone about the Lord Jesus Christ, but then you don't live it. Your words are falling on deaf ears. Right. Yeah. They have to see the power of the changed life in you. He goes on down a little bit further and he says, And ye became followers, imitators of us, is what that means, those that pattern after us. They, they became patterns, they patterned themselves after Paul when they beheld their behavior and heard their words. And you became followers of us and of the Lord having received the word in much affliction, and if you go back to Acts chapter 17, you'll see how that, that early church received much persecution and affliction, but yet they still received that word, uh, but they did it with joy in the Holy Spirit. So you can go through trials and sufferings and persecutions and still be joyful as a Christian when you know God. So that we were in samples to all that believed in Macedonia and Achaia. Notice that word. We were in samples or examples. We were examples to them, to believers. We're to be examples to believers. Yes. They're, they're not just to the lost, but we are to be examples to believers. And, and, and those believers may be uh, those of our household, our wife, our husband, or our children, our mom or our dad. Yes. And we need to be an example to them. They hear our words, but do they see it in our behavior, in our life? The, Bible, the song says, May all who come behind us find us faithful. May the fire of our devotion light their way. May the footprints that we leave lead them to believe and the lives we live inspire them to obey. Does your life inspire other believers to obey? Do you, do you practice what you preach, I guess would be the way to say it. Go over to 1 Timothy chapter 4 now if you would please. First Timothy 
Timothy chapter 4, we'll just begin reading verse 11, just pick it up here for the sake of time. He says, These things command and teach, let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believer, of the believers, in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Here we find Paul telling young Timothy, a young preacher, he says, not only are we to be a, an example to believers, we are to be an example of the believer. Be an example of the believer. What is a believer? Well, the world has a very distorted view of what a believer is, right. and that falls on ourselves. Because we are the one that they're watching. The Lord's church. Those that go out there and claim to be a Christian, that claim to have been saved, that claim to be a new creature, and old things have passed away, and all things have become new, and now you have been buried with Christ, and you've walked in newness, and, and, and risen with Christ, and walked in newness of life, but they don't see the new life. They don't see the light that Brother Graber talked about last night. They don't see the light. Our life's been put under a bushel. We're not being an example of what a believer ought to be. We fail sometimes in our witnessing. Maybe we, maybe we invite people to church and maybe we have a, a visitation ministry and we knock on doors and we pass out tracts. We talk to our neighbors, our homes, our, our work and whatever and we're not seeing any results. Well, maybe it could be that they're not seeing it in our lives. It's easy to talk. Jesus says it's not those that say but those that do. That's where the power comes in. Now, understand, it's the power, the ultimate power of salvation is of the Lord. Right. But he uses, right. as we heard last night, he uses this weak human instrument to deliver that message and to exemplify that message right. of a believer. He gives us here in verse 7, chapter 4, excuse me, I'm Verse 12, he says, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believer in word and conversation. Conversation means your lifestyle, your behavior. Be an example in your behavior. In charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. So he gives us here an outline of what we need to be as we're going to be an example. Because we're living in a glass house and people are watching us, people are looking at us in every aspect of our life. Not just when you come to church. You see, the way you come to church and the way you behave here, that's what's expected of you. And it's easy to do it here because everybody else is doing it. But when you go out there, there is eyes upon you. They're reading you like a book, chapter by chapter. You're an epistle written on their heart, known and read of all men. They're watching you. And they hear you say, well, I'm a believer. And then they hear you say some other things that a believer probably wouldn't say. You say They hear you say, I'm a believer, but then they see you go places that a believer probably wouldn't go. And you destroy your testimony and the witness. First of all, he says, when they, people look at us and, and they watch us, uh, that we ought to be an uh, example in word. As we're that example, not only to our families, which is a vital place for us to begin being an example, moms and dads, you've got boys and girls looking up to you and following you, they're watching you every day, not just at church. They hear you, Dad, when you sit in church and amen the preacher when he preaches against sin. They hear you when uh, you say that, boy, that's a good message, and man, I, that's what we ought to be doing. But then they hear you and watch you when you go home, and the way you act, and the way you live, and the way you treat their mother. Yeah. They're watching that. Are you being an example of the believer? See, you live in a glass house. You can't hide it. Right. You go out in the world, you're still in the glass house. People are watching you every moment. Unsaved people, co-workers, people who live across the street, people that you go to the store and run into uh, when you're driving the car. You're driving a car down the road, and somebody pulls out in front of you. How dare they? You're going to just give them a little piece of your mind, and you jump on that horn. Is that an example of a believer? 
Is that showing gentleness and kindness and forbearance and long-suffering? And then you pull up next to them and it's your deacon or... <laughs> <laughs> Or maybe it's somebody you just invited to church a week ago, and you look over at them, you know, you, how many, you do this, you know, they pull in front of you, you pull over there, and you always look at them. Don't you? You give them, you give them an eye. How dare you pull in front of me? What kind of example is that? And maybe your kids are sitting in the back seat of the car. Yeah. I have that problem a lot. My wife used to tell me every time, She'd, she'd preach my message right back to me when I do it. <laughs> you see, we're living in a glass house. Yes. You're living in a glass house. People are watching you. All of the time. People at school, boys and girls. People uh, where you do uh, any of your business and whatever you do, uh, they look at your life and they read your life line by line, chapter by chapter. He says, be an example in word. That is in your speech. Matthew 12, 34 says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Basically what that's saying, what's coming out of your mouth was in your heart first. Those evil words, not necessarily vulgarity, that gossip, that backbiting, that critical spirit, that's in your heart before it comes out of your mouth. Right. Out of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And people are watching you. They're watching you in your example, uh, in your speech. What kind of speech do you have? Look over at Colossians chapter 4 with me for a moment. Book of Colossians chapter 4. He says in, in uh, verse 2, we'll be, pick up there, he says, Continue uh, in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving, with all praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bond. Do you, do you spend any time at all speaking of the mysteries of Christ? That I may make manifest as I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom. Where? Toward them that are without. Redeeming the time. Take every advantage to walk before those that are without in wisdom because they are watching you. And believe me, folks, the world at large, the lost and dying world, they hate God, they hate God's word, and they hate you if you're a Christian, and they want to find anything they can in your life to blemish the name of Christ. And they're watching you to find it. So buy out that time and redeem it. And walk in wisdom toward those that are without. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt that Brother Graber talked about last night, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. Be gracious in your speech. Be seasoned with salt. Salt is a preservative. You ought to guard your words. You ought to, the salt is also a flavoring. Amen. You know, I, I've heard Christians and people talk about the Lord in such a hateful way that I didn't want to hear it. You want to talk about the Lord in such a loving way that people want to hear more. Amen. Oh, that's good. It's kind of, I like to use potato chips as an illustration because I love potato chips and you know, you just can't eat one. You eat one, you want another one, don't you? And our speech ought to be such that people want to hear more. Give me more of those answers. Tell me more about that Jesus. Not a, not a critical and harsh tone and, 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 and as such. So we ought to be careful. How many times have we said something to someone and the moment it leaves our mouth, we wish we could reach out and grab it and get it back? Yeah. I've done that, haven't you? Yeah. Oh, we, we do that. We, we give someone a piece of our mind. And you know, if you're like me, you don't have a whole lot to spare. You ought to hold on to it. And after we say it, we wish we could get it back. But we've already let it loose. And that, like a dart, has already found its mark in the heart of that intended subject. And it's cut them to the quick and hurt them. And you say, oh, I didn't mean that. I, I was just venting. But in their mind, they're thinking, if you didn't mean it, why did you say it? And it must have been in your heart because out of the heart flows the issues of life. You must have had it on your thoughts to say it. 
And so they don't really believe you didn't mean it. We need to be careful. We need to be an example with our speech. We need to take a moment before we... How many times do husbands and wives who love each other dearly, who have promised to love each other and hold dear to each other and to nurture one another and care for one another, how many times do they cut each other apart with their tongue? But not only are you cutting your wife and your husband, you're cutting your brother and sister in Christ. Amen. And your children are watching. Yeah. And you're being an example. You see, you're living in a glass house. Well, we went in the bedroom before we had that little discussion. <laughs> it don't matter. You're living in a glass house. They see what's going on in your life. We ought to be careful. There's power in words, folks. There's power to hurt. But there's power to heal yes. and worse. Lost my wife a year ago. Most tragic thing I ever dealt with in my life. Yeah. I don't. I can't imagine anything ever could be worse. Yeah. But I had people come up and give me words of encouragement and comfort that just blessed my heart. You know, I did. It just said the right thing at the right time, the right way. And and sometimes it was just one or two words. And sometimes they might have not even said a word. They just come up with their arm. Help you heal. Yes. And we can use that speech to heal people. And people are watching us and they're saying, wow, that's what a Christian is like. I like some of that. Mm -hmm. They're so kind and considerate and caring of each other and one another. Boy, that church is a loving church. I would like to go to that church. But when you go out there in the world, and I remember going to, over here to J.C. Penney's. And... Uh, <coughs> I'm an impatient person, in case you don't know. Um, I, I need to work on that more. But I was standing in line, and a guy was standing in line before me, and the girl that was standing there was working with one hand, and I'm one of those silly phone things, you know, that we can't get away from. Mm -hmm. Talking, you know, and she's talking. She's given 99% of her attention to that phone and 1% attention to that customer, and it's taken forever to do a five-minute trans transaction. And the guy in front of me, man, he is starting to steam. I was watching it come out of his head. <laughs> now he's boiling. And he kind of turned around to me. He said, I can't wait to get up there. I am going to tell her, put that phone down and take care of me. And he gets up there and he just begins. And this girl starts crying. And he walked away and she's trying to keep her composure and she's wiping her eyes. And I get up there and I said, um, and I was, I was getting upset too. I'm not, I'm, I'm not the good, the good guy that I don't want you to think you know, I'm better than everybody else or anything, but I started saying something, but I'm not going to say it. <laughs> Private joke. Um, <laughs> caught myself. I watched my tongue. <laughs> but I seen her, and my heart broke for her, and I got up there, and I said, you're having a bad day, aren't you? And she says, you don't know the half of it. I just got a phone call. One of my loved ones, I can't remember who it was, but just went to the hospital. It was very serious. You see, someone who's irritating us and not giving us the attention that we think we should deserve, they may be having a bad right, day. Right. And instead of using words to heal that person, we just cut them up. Yeah. Cut them into pieces and hurt them. Mm -hmm. Christian ought to be careful because they're being watched. Man. Now, the people that stood behind me, which do you think they thought more of? The first guy or me? Which do you think was more loving? Now, they probably didn't know I was a Christian. I didn't tell her I was a Christian or anything of that nature. But if I had been talking to those people or had witnessed to those people and told them I was a Christian and walked up there and did that, what that guy did, what kind of a believer is that that would do such a thing as that? We can motivate with our words. We can motivate our children with our words. And we can tear them down with our words. We can cut them up, can't we? We can make them feel like they're useless, helpless, unable to do anything. Or we can motivate them and we can encourage them and build them up. Not only our children, each other, husbands and wives and friends and family. Words. Words are powerful. Emotions are controlled with words. If you're having a bad day, somebody comes in, they can just bring comfort to you with the right words. Husband comes in, his wife's got having a bad day. He can go up to her and say, honey... You go take a nap. I'll do the dishes. Boy, that comforts that person. None. We can comfort people with words. We need to be careful. Christians need to guard their speech. We don't need to have any 
filthy communication coming out of our mouth. Critical spirit. Paul also said that we need to be example in our conversation. And in this sense, conversation means our life. Right. And basically, we ought to practice what we preach. We have a God of love, kindness, gentleness, forbearance, long-suffering with us, forgiving to us. And He is also a God of justice and a God of wrath. He's also those things, but He's holy and He knows everything we don't. We don't even know our own heart. The heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? But God knows our heart. Right. So he can judge us. But we can't be judging each other's heart because we don't know it. Amen. But we judge lives, don't we? We've, have you ever said it? They say they're a Christian. They say they're a believer. Now you don't know their heart, but you've been watching their life. and He's not being an example to the believer. He's not being an example of the believer. And we make judgments. Right or wrong, correct or incorrect. Because of the way we're living. We need to be careful. Amen. Paul said on Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, only let your conversation, in this portion of Scripture, the word conversation actually means citizenship. He says only let your conversation or your identification of your citizenship, if you will, be as it becomes the gospel of Christ. When I first moved up to Michigan from down south in Virginia, I kind of used to speak like this, you know? And I used to talk with a little bit of a drawl and accent. And people would say, you must be a Yankee. <laughs> no, they'd say, you must be a hillbilly. How did they know that? I didn't tell them I was a hillbilly. Well, my speech betrayed me, didn't it? Our, our citizenship is not here on earth, folks. We ought not to behave like an earthling. Our citizenship is in heaven, and we ought to behave like a Christian. Amen. We ought to behave heavenly in such a way that we act as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come to see you or else be absent, that I may hear of your affairs, hear of how you're living, how the people know how you're living because they're beholding it, that I might hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, there's that unity, one mind, Brother Bourne talked about, striving together for the faith of the gospel. <coughs> you know the, the worst enemy of a church to the field that the Lord has planted them in to be a witness is that church. It's not the devil. It's the church. When they see a church fighting amongst themselves right. and criticizing each other, talking about each other and belittling each other and having church problems and having church splits and then go out there and, oh, I'd like to invite you to the most wonderful church in the world. What kind of example is that? That's right. You see, we're living in a glass house and not only as individuals but as a church. First Thessalonians, Paul was writing to the church of Thessalonians. The whole church needed to be an example to, of the believer. And you as a church, as well as an individual, need to be an example of a believer. Striving together, working together, and loving one another. And we'll get to that next. If we say we're a Christian, we ought to be careful how we act because we're living in a glass house. Amen. People are watching you. What do they see? What, what, what is their opinion of a Christian by your life? You may be the only Christian. You may be the only Christ they ever see. What, what do they have? What kind of opinion do they have of, of Christ by the way that you act, by the way that you speak? Next, Paul said, be an example in love. Love is the bond of perfectness. Love is that which holds everything else together. Amen. Jesus said himself, a new commandment I give unto you, not a suggestion, but a commandment in, in John 13, 34 and 35. He says, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you. How did he love us? He loved us so much he gave himself for us. So that means I ought to give myself for you. First message Bob Lamb preached at 12 Ryan Baptist Church at, at, once he got on the, on the field of the church 
was for you. For you. I want to be used up for you. And that's the attitude that we ought to have, is that we ought to be willing to die for one another, to live for one another. He says that we're to love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples, if ye have loved one for another. They're watching our love. Now you can go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and find a definition of this agape love and see if you love each other that way. We are not going to go there tonight. But are you long-suffering and kind and patient? Or self-centered and it's all about me? It's not a, your doctrine. It's not how big your church is. It's not the programs you have. It's not the ministries that you have. It's not how good your preacher is at preaching the Word. It's that you have loved one. May all men know you're my disciples, that you have loved one for the other. Amen. We're living in a glass house and people are watching. How do we love each other? And they say, well, if that's love... I don't want that kind of love. <laughs> if that's what Christian love is, don't give me any of that. We're living in a vast house, folks. Amen. Love is powerful, just like words. Lives have been changed just because someone loved someone. They loved them enough to go out of their way. They loved them enough to put their own concerns and needs aside to love someone else and help someone. We ought to be that way. We ought to be faithful to love one another. Look over in the book of 1 Peter, if you will, with me, chapter 1. We talked about continuing in our ministry at Grace Baptist Church here, your ministry, and how that we can be an example before a world that would desire them to come in to our fellowship. When we invite them, when we witness to them, when the Lord saves them, and then we encourage them to be baptized and join our church. And they say, well, I, I've seen some of those members, and I want some of that. I want to be part of that church. Or do they say, now, I've seen some of the members there. And I, I'll pass, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'll pass. What happened? They were watching us, and we're in a glass house. First right. Peter chapter 1, and verse 22, it says, Seeing ye... Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, and you're only going to obey it through the Spirit, unto an unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. An unfeigned love means unpretentious. You know, I, I, I've experienced this. You've experienced it more than likely. You come into church, and one of the church members comes up, Hey, brother, how you doing? Boy, I've been thinking about you, praying for you all week. And you know the guy can't stand you. <laughs> you know, they got this pretentious love. Pretend to love you. Hypocritical actors. They act like they're, you, they're your best friend. The minute you walk out, I mean, can you believe the tie that guy wore? I mean, really. A silk tie. I mean, oh, I love him. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a feigned love. And we do that sometimes. And the world's watching us. Faith, love one for another. And he says we ought to do it fervently. I mean, it ought to be a fervent love. We ought to be on fire for the love of Christ Amen. toward that person and helping that person and the needs that that person had to get along. And again, that love is described in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples and that you have love one for another. Amen. How do they know we have love for one another? We don't go around saying, I love Brother Boren. I love Brother Graver. I love Brother Ron. We don't go around saying that. They watch how we treat each other. Amen. Now, if you've been around the Boren house recently, you would know that we love each other. <laughs> because we wouldn't tolerate what we've been through if we didn't. <laughs> We've been having a great time. I'm not so sure we've guarded our words a lot, but it's all been in good, lighthearted fun. Amen. But people watch you. You're in a glass house. You think you're hiding it. You're not. You're not hiding it from your kids. You're not hiding it from your husband, from your wife. You're not hiding it from your neighbor, from your doctor, from your dentist. You're in a glass house. Yes. Are you an example to the believer? 
Are you an example of a believer? Next he says that we ought to be an example in spirit. And here I think he's talking about attitude. The spirit of our interactions with one another. Philippians 2.5 says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, in the attitude that we have. What kind of attitude do you have? You know, sometimes we do things, but we have a bad attitude about it. The preacher preaches a spirit-filled, God-led message to the, aimed at the members of the, that particular church. And that church has some needs, and the preacher preaches about it. And I'll do it, but your attitude just stinks. Or you'll do something for somebody, but you got a bad attitude about it. Your attitude determines your altitude. Christians ought to have had their head up because they have a great God. Amen. Amen. And our God commands us that we love one another and that we be aware of our speech and our conduct and our citizenship, which is in heaven. How's your attitude toward God? Attitude of a Christian toward God should be that of reverence. You come into the house of God... You're standing on holy ground, folks, because Christ is here. Amen. The Holy Spirit is in each of our hearts, and Christ is in the midst of his church. Amen. You're standing before a thrice holy God, and we ought to have a reverence for God, and we ought to have a reverence for his building. That's right. This building has been sanctified, it's been set apart for the purpose of worship. It's not a country club, it's not a gymnasium, it's not a party place, it's the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we ought to reverence God when we come before His presence. We ought to be submissive to one another. Wives submissive to their husbands, and husbands ought to be submissive to the Lord. Children ought to be submissive to their parents, and we ought to submit one to the other. Yes. And you ought to be submissive to your pastor, too. Mm -hmm. In yeah. the Spirit. Obey them to have the rule over you. We ought to have an attitude of love toward God. Amen. We ought to have an attitude of trust toward God. We trust Him. He says, jump, we say, how high, God? <laughs> we trust Amen. Him. That's our attitude. People are watching you. What's your attitude? There ought to be an attitude of obedience. There ought to be an attitude of humbleness. There ought to be an attitude of worship. Oh, how long has it been since you've really felt like you've worshipped God in the assembly? I don't just mean sing a few worship songs. I mean, you felt like you were being drawn to the very throne in heaven before God. And you saw him sitting on the throne in all his splendor, in all his glory, in all his majesty, and you worshipped him in song. What's your attitude toward worship? Oh, how I love Jesus. This is song service is over. What's your attitude toward prayerfulness? Now, people, I don't know you well enough to judge you in any of these things, and I'm not. This message was, <laughs> I've, I've already had this message twice, or this is my second time, so I, I'm preaching to myself. You ever go, go to God in prayer, and it's kind of like one of these things? Thank you, Lord, for all your blessings. Amen. You just came boldly, with confidence, before the throne of grace, and you didn't give him two seconds of your mind, or thoughts, or time. Now, if he's got time for us, I think we ought to find some time for him. Amen. Amen. In prayer. What's your attitude toward prayer? You're in a glass house, and your children are watching you in your prayer life. Do your children ever walk in on you praying? What are you doing, Dad? I'm talking to God. I'm talking to God. I'll be out there in a minute, son. This is important. Phone rings, and you just started your prayer. Oh, excuse me, God, this is important. Yeah? You can't wait to answer that phone. Might, might be something important. If it is, it'll wait. Because you're talking to the most important person in your life. Amen. God. What's your attitude toward that? What's your attitude toward your children? You love your children. Do you understand that they're a heritage? you understand that they've been given to you in this short time to care for them and nurture them and train them up in the way that they should go, that when they are old they won't depart from it? Do you understand the, the how precious children are? What's your attitude toward them? 
What's your attitude toward God's children? Your brothers and sisters in Christ. They offend you, they let you down, they criticize you, they talk about you, they hurt you, and they will at one time or another. There's going to be somebody out there to do that. What's your attitude toward them? What was Christ's attitude toward me? When I was the enemy of God and at enmity with God, had no time for God, didn't care about God, didn't love God, mocked God, criticized God, lived for the world, and his attitude toward me was love and giving himself to save me. Forgiveness. And after I'm saved, I still falter and fall at times. And his, his attitude toward me is, if, if I'll just confess those, he's faithful and just to cleanse me from all my unrighteousness and forgive me of all my transgressions, my sins. That's his attitude. What's yours? What's your attitude toward authority? Coming up to an election year. We don't like it. Not much to like. But who is the one that gave us government? Who instituted authority in the land? What's your attitude toward that? To kings. He says we all lift up hands to pray to, for kings. Peter says governors. And all those in authority. You know, I wonder sometimes if we prayed half as much for President Obama, if we criticized him, I wonder if maybe the Lord would change his heart. Well, you don't think he can? He can, can he? What's our attitude toward people? Toward our leaders, toward our husbands, wives? I'm as good as he is. More than likely, you're better. I know that's true, and well, I'm not going to say that either. <laughs> I know it's true sometimes. <laughs> I know it's true in my life. But what's your attitude towards your husband? I ain't going to submit to him. I'm as good as he is. It has nothing to do with who's the better or the worst. It has to do with God's command. Submit to your husband. Husbands, what's your attitude towards your wife? I don't know. Man, sometimes she just irritates me to death. I don't care. God says love her. A God in love. 1 Corinthians 13 love. What's your attitude toward her? What's your attitude toward hard circumstances and troubles and trials in your life? Man, I don't know what we're going to do. I don't know how we're going to survive this. Is, is this a catastrophe? Life's over. You're, you're in a glass house and your children are watching you and you just got done going to church and hearing how powerful God is and that he's able to supply all of our needs and greatly above all that we can even think or ask for. And here we are worried about some little bill or some little situation, some little sickness in our life. And people are watching us. And then we tell them, you ought to come and, and know my Lord and Savior you know, you don't, you don't seem to have much trust in them. Why should I? What's your attitude toward hard times? What's your attitude toward your church? It's not a perfect church. Yeah, that's true. And you don't help with any. <laughs> if you find a perfect church, please don't join it because that will be the end of it. Because we're not perfect people, folks. It's the Lord's church. And if there's something in it that's not right, make it better. Do something for it. Help it. Get involved. Back your pastor up. Stand with them. Pray Amen. for them. Amen. Be faithful to it. Not only when it's convenient, all the time. Be faithful to your church. What's your attitude toward going to church? Is it the most important thing to you, or is it just falling... If I happen to have time, I'll go. What's your attitude toward working in the church? Are you willing? Do you make yourself available? It doesn't matter if you're able or not. If you're available, God will get to make you able. He's able to do that. It's not your talent, it's your time. It doesn't matter how much talent you got if you don't have any time for your church. Do you have the time that the church needs? Oh, attitude. What's your attitude toward the lost? There go I, but by the grace of God. There's a drug addict, prostitute, homeless person, extortion. Does it really matter? Paul said he was the chief of the sinner. Anything you want to put in there, 
Paul said, there go I, by the grace of God. What's your attitude toward that lost person? Well, they need, they do. They need Christ. Don't they? Yes. They need the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the attitude we ought to have for them. I don't know if I want that person in my church. Somebody might have thought that about you before you came. Right? You know? What's your attitude? Attitude's important. We need to watch our attitude because people are watching. We can say the right thing and, and do the right thing, but have a bad attitude and destroy it. Then Paul said, an example in your faith. Do you have faith? Do you really believe God? How many of you like to see Grace Baptist Church? I'm just a rhetorical question. How many of you like to see Grace Baptist Church grow this year? See, 25 people saved and added to the church. Do you have faith? Put some feet on that faith. Get out there and witness. Amen. Invite some people in. Live with Christ before them. I believe God can do it, man. I'm going out there and do my part. God uses us, doesn't he? We're to live by faith. We're to walk by faith. We're to serve by faith. We're to war by faith. We're to worship by faith. We're to work by faith. People need to see our faith. Our children need to see our faith. When we came down here 11 years, or, well, 13, almost 14 years ago, I guess, getting close to it, we got a U-Haul and we drove down here and we had a great trip till we hit Florida. And then after we hit Florida, I was beginning to wonder if I misread the Lord's will. Everything happened. Truck broke down, excuse me, three, four times. We ended up stalled in a, in a motel parking lot, and it was overrun by uh, uh, harvesters for the that year, the oranges or whatever, oranges, oranges, you know, things you make orange juice out of. I mean, they were ever drinking whiskey. Laying on the hood of the car, their shirts were off, and dancing, and talking ungodly. And here I am with my little eight-year-old granddaughter, the most precious thing in the world, Elizabeth. And I called the U-Haul place, and they said, well, just get a room there. We'll pay for it. I said, I am not putting my family in this place. You come and get us and take us to a, a safe hotel. And I'm sitting there, man, and I'm just, I don't know what to do. I, I, I don't know how we're going to fix it. I, and Elizabeth looked up at me from standing down on the ground. I was sitting in the truck, and she says, Papa, I know what. Let's pray. <laughs> you see, she was watching me. Yep. Yeah. What kind of example did I show that little girl of my faith in God? Have you ever done that before? In difficult and challenging times? We're living in a glass house. When we, when we lift up our eyes and look out there, we see all the multitudes of people standing outside our house looking at us, reading us, watching our lives. And then lastly, he said we need to be an example in purity. It's something that today that people just don't seem to care about. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but the Bible says that it is written, Be holy, because I am holy means that comes from the word to be separate. Be separate from the world. There ought to be something different about us. When we go out in the world and we're being watched, it's not if they watch us, they are watching us, and they ought to see something different about us. We ought to be holy, not only in our conversation, not only in our citizenship, not only in our behavior, not only in our attitude, but in our appearance. We ought to be holy. People ought to, they ought to see us. Sometimes they'll never talk to us. The only thing they're ever going to do is see the outside of us. And I know that that doesn't mean anything, but if it's on the inside, it should show on the outside. Now, it can be on the outside and not be on the inside. I understand that. That's not my problem. <laughs> but if it's in my heart, people ought to be able to see it in the way I live and the way I look out in the world. Amen. We ought not to be running around ungodly and immoral, acting immoral before the world because we're living in a glass house. How many of you lived in a glass house? Would you get out of the shower and walk out into your living room without any clothes on? I mean, that sounds absolutely ridiculous, doesn't it? But people do that. In a glass house they live in, they get out of the world and live before others like that. And then they say, I'm a believer. What kind of an example of a believer is that? 
Paul told Timothy, be an example in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. I want to read this to you quickly. I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. Listen to these words. I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. I'd rather one should walk with me than merely tell the way. The eye is a better pupil, more willing than the ear. Fine counsel is confusing, but example is always clear. And the best of all the preachers are men who live their creeds, for to see a good put in action is what everybody needs. I can soon learn how to do it if you will let me see it done. I can watch your hand in action, but your tongue may too fast run. And the lecture you're delivering may be very wise and true, but I'd rather get my lesson from observing what you do. For I may misunderstand you and the high advice you give, but there's no misunderstanding how you act and live. When I see a deed of kindness, I am eager to be kind. When a weaker brother stumbles and a strong man stands behind, just to see if you can help him, then the wish grows strong in me to become as strong and thoughtful as I know that friend to be. And all the travelers can witness that best of guides today is not the one who tells them, but the one who shows them the way. One good man teaches many. Many believe what they behold. One deed of kindness, no, is worth a thousand that are told. Who stands with men of honor and learns to hold his honor dear? For right living speaks a language which, is every, which to everyone is clear. Though an able speaker charms me with his elegance, I say, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. Amen.